This program is made possible by a grant from the First National Bank of Maryland. <laughs> So yes, Montague yeah. and Kinsman, they both have a very... Hello, uh, my name is Terence Winch. Welcome to The Writing Life. It's my pleasure today to introduce you to the, uh, the work of one of Ireland's leading poets, Eamon Grennan. Uh, in a relatively short time, Eamon Grennan has become one of uh, Ireland's best known poets. Born uh, in Dublin uh, and currently a professor of English at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie in upstate New York, uh, Eamon is also a, a well-known scholar. He has a, a doctorate from Harvard in uh, specializing in Shakespeare, and he's written extensively on many literary subjects, uh, prominent among them the uh, state of contemporary Irish writing. He's published his poems widely in journals and magazines, both in Ireland and in America. Uh, again, I would say The New Yorker is probably the most prominent among them. Um, let me start, Eamon, with, uh, with a question or issue that I, I know that you've dealt with before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, your work is in many ways absent any traditional Irish signposts. I mean, we're not aware of, uh, of being in Ireland, in a sense, when we're in your aesthetic universe. In fact, as I read through your poems, I, I was often reminded of Hopkins uh, and the Windhover in particular, and uh, of Wordsworth and his empathetic mm -hmm. involvement in the natural world. And uh, I wonder if you could tell us what, in your mind, makes your work specifically Irish? Well, I mean, the question's a difficult one to begin with because you write about, I personally write about what's under my nose, and what was under my nose when I started writing tended to be American things because I started again, really, when I came uh, after being at graduate school. And it wasn't until, as you say, I got a late start. It wasn't until the late 70s. In other words, I was in my late, uh, I, I was in my late 30s when I started. First book was published after I was 40. And the, you know, the landscape I was trying to accommodate was basically an American landscape. But I would think that what my work deals with is a kind of migratory uh, reality in which I'm accounting for both uh, an, an Irish experience, which is my past, and an American experience, which is my present, but not self-consciously or not deliberately and not with a kind of purpose, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I'd say in some ways I'm a kind of occasional poet in the sense that I write about very uh, the stimuli tend to be very immediate to mm -hmm. me. I uh, take a kind of angular uh, um, response, if you like, to the Irish context. I, I've written poems about its landscape, but you do have to look at the poems carefully to see what the fauna and flora are. Yes. Sometimes yeah. it'll be writing about a bird. It's a cardinal. And other times it'll be, uh, it'll be a chaffinch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I don't, I, I regard my, my poetry as in some way trying to summarize for myself what it means to be migrant, you know, what it means to be a mover between two spaces. Uh, How long have you been in this country? I've been here since the early 60s, uh, since the middle 60s, I guess. Yes. And I've been here fairly constantly since, but I do go home, every, I still call home over there. Yes. I'm, a, I'm that beautiful thing, uh, um, a resident alien. <laughs> which, uh, you know, it, it seems to belong to the poetic condition. Yeah. We're all resident aliens right. in our right. way. But I, I go home, as I say, every summer or for longer periods. I publish there. And my commitment is to a sense to not lose that, not in the same way as I don't want to lose my accent. Yeah. <laughs> you know? what, uh, what accounts for the late start? Uh, oh, probably the kind of two things. One, uh, you know, starting to do, be a graduate student and starting to feel, okay, I've got to do a lot of this stuff uh, in the academic world. I was, you know, I, I was doing academic work. And the second being, it seems to me, something like what happens to a spirit or what happens to a condition, or, you know, what happens to a self when you're transplanted. You kind of get retarded 
you, you stop growing yes. in yeah. some way. You, 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 some part of yourself has to, has to catch up. Reacclimate. Yeah, yeah. reacclimate yeah. to yourself to your environment, and I suspect it took me that decade in this country to establish a self that I felt this self wants to write. Were you writing before that decade? Yeah, you, I mean, I was writing, writing in UCD when I was in when I was in UCD in University College Dublin. I was I wrote I wrote short stories. I edited a magazine. I was you know. One of the literary, uh, ah. literary people. <laughs> so, and I wrote throughout, and even while I was, uh, even while I was here, as a graduate, or just after I left graduate school and got married, I would write little bits and pieces. But uh, it wasn't until 1977, 78, that I decided, okay, I'm going to go home. I want to take an unpaid leave. I want to see if I can write. I will try to, having been transplanted into America, I will now transplant myself trans transplant myself back mm -hmm. into Irish mm -hmm. context and see if I can hook up with a kind of literary um, condition over there and that's what I did you know I wrote articles I wrote reviews and I wrote lots of poems and they became a first book and you kept a very strenuous academic life going as yeah, well yeah i mean you know i was i was i was a teacher i was a teacher and i was a publisher i mean i published articles and i had to get tenure so so yeah. it's it's a, you know, you know this as a musician and as a worker and as a poet and as a short story writer, uh, as a writer and, and, and other things. Uh, you know, we juggle many lives. Yeah, exactly. That's what we're doing yeah. all the time. Yeah. Mine happens to be uh, a very binary, very dual, you know, in, in its visual form, i.e. Ireland, America, academic, uh, writer of poems. Do uh, they blur at all? Do you teach uh, Yeah, I writing? teach, no, I teach uh, some You do writing. teach some writing. Yeah. And that's good. I mean, yeah. I enjoy that. I do more of that now since the books came out than I did before. And I quite enjoy that because what are you doing when you teach writing? Well, you're sitting around being yourself and kind of advising young people with the uh, wisdom of your life. Yes. It's a powerful situation. Has being a poet sort of saved you from the, the whole uh, uh, need for academic publications no, well, in a way? Yeah, or? absolutely. Not, not entirely. I mean, in order to get tenure, I had to be my uh, academic self. You did, yeah. What I like to see now, uh, because I write much more about Irish poetry, a kind of uh, ease in which those two lives belong to one another. Yeah. Uh, one thing, uh, another thing I want to ask you about changing the subject a little bit is you've, you've written a lot about contemporary Irish poetry. I think you're, mm. you're probably one of the, uh, the, the more articulate spokesmen out there right now. And um, uh, one, of the, one of the points you mentioned, I think it might have been in the uh, Colby Quarterly issue that you uh, mm -hmm. lent me, was that although there's a great deal of vitality and variety in Irish poetry today, there's also a lot of squabbling and fighting and and uh, battles over who's in and who's out. Mm. And uh, you know, without making any enemies or yeah, you know, without you, mentioning names, if you want to you want to <laughs> risk making any, you know, go right ahead. No, no, this could be you an say something about how that works? I mean, who? I, I have a sense of how the literary uh, 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 how literary politics work over here. Um, but I wonder if you could give us some insight into what goes on in Ireland. Is it controlled by universities or uh, um, I wouldn't think it's controlled by universities, or? by publishers to a degree, and there are very few of them. I think the point, Yeats uh, announced, uh, out of Ireland have we come great hatred, little room. And <laughs> uh, one of the good couplets. Right. And I, I think the same applies to any small community within that country in which uh, there's a need uh, for support. Okay, so there's a small pie and there are a many hungry mouths. There's a lot of talent, there's a lot of jostling for position. As, I, as, as Adrian Fraser said in one of those articles, which I gave the title Cannon Fodder to, mm -hmm. uh, because it's about making cannons, right, right, you know, making, right. the, uh, making who's in and who's out. Yeah. And it seems to me that that really is a sort of literary uh, consequence of the jostling within Irish life itself for a definition of what Ireland is. A definition that cannot finally be clear as long as the North and the Republic are in the condition they're yeah. in. Yeah. Not to say that therefore a united Ireland is what will allow for definition, but definition is what Ireland has been about, North and South, and North and South, if you like, for the last uh, 45, uh, for the last 75 years. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and it's not over yet. Mm -hmm. And I think the literary jostling for position, the groups, the, the need for um, poets writing in Irish, for example, Nulani Gonal, mm -hmm. Michael Hartnett, others, Michal O'Shiel uh, and others, the, the, the way those groups hang on to their own definition of what it might mean to be Irish. In other words, to be Irish is still a category of interest to us. Yes. In a way that to be American right. is probably not to you. No, I, and I have the sense too in, in reading uh, a lot of your work and in, in just in my, in my general knowledge of what goes on over there is that I, one gets the feeling that no matter what camp any particular writer is in, Everybody knows everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And everyone it's a village. Knows, yeah, everyone knows everyone's work in a way that you can't hear, in, in a sense, no. because it's it's just too big. And you just many. look at ourselves here. I mean, I write poems here. You write poems here. We've never read one another except right. very vaguely. Yeah. There is squads of men and women out there on the West Coast, in the Middle West, right. in states alone, yes. whom you have never heard of, yeah. who have never heard of you writing in their own little bellowicks and in their own yes. little villages of uh, contentment of a certain kind. Now, Ireland is just one of those. And the fact is that it's as big as whatever state Ireland is as big as, I forget. But it's a small space, but we're all there. I'm not, in some sense. I'm out of it. But they're all there. And there is uh, an urgent it lends urgency, but it also lends a certain kind of squabble. I don't mind. I mean, I'm safe from it, and I shouldn't talk about well, it Well, I want to ask you about that. Uh, uh, you're safe from it in a way, but I wonder if among, among those Irish writers who stay in Ireland yeah. and, and who are you know, perhaps more, uh, uh, more concerned with the definition of, of Irish writing, yeah. is there, uh, do, do, do people like you, Irish writers who kind of span... Uh, um, both continents. Do, do you uh, attract any resentment on the part of some of those people? For I wouldn't think. I wouldn't. I, I, I hope resentment not resentment. Too hard a word, yeah, but, but I, I think I'd put it like this: that credentials nice, get questioned at all. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't think. I mean, uh, entirely that. But I will say this: that when I started and my first book or two came out, there was more probably more interest in me than there is now. Uh, it's funny, I, I, I titled my last book as if it matters. <laughs> uh, so uh, that was itself a kind yes. of literary gesture yeah. towards precisely the thing you're talking to, yeah. which is that, well, I've got to do it the way I see it. And the way in which I'm Irish is, of course, important to me. Uh, it's the reason I stay Irish and yeah. a resident alien and so on. But as a poet, it's as if it matters. I, I write about the world. I write about the world I know. I write about the world I make, the world that's delivered to me, the world I unmake. Uh, part of that is in Ireland. Part of it's about Ireland. If I write a poem about the North, it comes in at an angle to a problem that I am in sort of, uh, sort of held within, I mean, that's held uh, apart from me. I don't feel any particular right and authority there. Nonetheless, I would think I am not representative of anything. I don't know if any poet ever is or should be representative of anything, but I do occupy a curious zone, a sort of amphibious yeah. zone yeah. Uh, in which I am partially there, partially here. In Ireland, I'm not quite Irish. But in America, well, I'm not quite American. Right. 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 So, yeah. Uh, you it's know, this isn't made, it's, a double, yeah. it's a double life or a half life. Right. Which, which of course, has characterized the lives and careers of many Precisely. Irish writers. Precisely. Uh, so, in that way, I haven't made a point of that, but I suspect a careful reader of what I write about might see, for example, the issue of home as being at the center of a good deal of the work I do. Yeah. And I think that that issue of home has to be opened up into an. Uh, um, a, a discussion, if it were that to be the case, about my Irishness and my uh, migrant status, yes. as it were. And what does home mean? I, I leave it, I go back to it, I, I'm unwilling to let loose, and yet home is a contemporary theme, yeah, if yes, you like. Yeah. Home, homelessness. Yeah. I don't mention these things overtly, but I suspect they are subtextually uh, forceful, uh, subtextually present in what yes. I do. You know? Well, speaking of your work, um, mm. one reviewer wrote that there's a largeness, a generosity, an unforced openness to experience that affirms 
what we have in common rather than the, the barriers that we erect to divide us. Uh, that's one of many things that could be said about your work, which is very rich and varied. And I wondered now if you could take a few minutes and, and read a couple of poems. Uh, one that, uh, uh, that I would like to hear in particular is Endangered Species from As If It Matters. Uh, okay. Uh, and and this, this, may, this may in some ways touch what we're saying because it, um, I call the poem Endangered Species, but it's about my kids. It's about, it's about my two older kids and the child that was just born. The, the landscape of the poem, the actual physical landscape, is the west of Ireland. You wouldn't know that necessarily. Yeah. It's about family. And yet, to me, the fact that this is happening in the west of Ireland, in that uh, little garden of the little place I, 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 I live in the summers, is terribly important to the point of the poem, that the kind of little unit that's being uh, let to be present there is, is partially growing out of that landscape, you know. And yet, the point when it comes out is not so much generalized as universalized as an image of endangerment, yes. uh, okay, yeah. of, 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 of kids in this case. You mightn't get that from it, but endangered species. Out the living room window, I see the two older children burning household trash under the ash tree in wind and rain. They move in slow motion about the flames, heads bowed in concentration as they feed each fresh piece in, hair blown wild across their faces, the fire wavering in tongues before them, so they seem creatures half flame, half flesh, wholly separate from me. All of a sudden, the baby breaks slowly down through the flexed branches of the ash in a blaze of blood and green leaves an amniotic drench, a gleaming liver purple slop of ripe placenta, head first and wailing to be amongst us. Boy and girl look up in silence and hold gravely out flame-feathered arms to catch her, who lands on her back in their linked and ashen hands. Later, when I take her in my arms, for a walk to that turn in the high road where the sea always startles, I can see how at intervals she's thunderstruck by a scalloped green leaf, a shivering jig of grass heads, or the speckled bee who pushes himself among the purple and scarlet parts of a fuchsia bell. And her eyes are on fire. That's nice. That's beautiful. And, I mean, my point about that, Brodsky was asked once what his obligations were as political creature, Harold Brodsky, and he thought a moment, not even a moment, he said, to the language. Mm. And in some ways, I, I, I believe that. I believe that what one is after is registering as fully as possible, as completely as possible, as complicatedly as possible, the nature of your existence and the nature of your existence as it registers in the language. Okay, so, yes. yeah. you know, you're trying to find in language some kind of uh, some kind of register for your existence. Yes. Okay, so yeah. in this case, it was a question of just ritualizing the, uh, uh, my fear about yeah. Yeah. the preservation of my kids. Yes. You know, in, in this slightly surreal little image. Read another, please. Um, I'll read another because I'll read Station, and of course, being a Catholic, the word Station isn't going to get lost on you. Right. Right? Uh, it's not lost on me either, but of course, it's a journey poem, and it happens to be about saying goodbye to my child, my older son. Uh, my older, uh, one of my older children, uh, the boy, Connor, who was leaving where we lived, he and I, uh, to go, uh, he and I and, uh, and, and my companion, to go and live with his mother. We were divorced. So it's about, you know, once again, I'm divorced from Ireland, I'm divorced from a family. I sense that these things are probably not to be too facile, <laughs> not unconnected, right, right, okay? Right. Are at least to say that for a poem to work the charge has to come from a variety of sources, but register as the force that drives one wheel. Okay, the poem is one wheel, mm -hmm. but it's been driven by forces. Mm -hmm. And in this case, uh, I'm often saying goodbye to my kids, as, mm -hmm. as, as the case may be, but who's not? Yeah. All right, yeah. I mean, having kids is to learn how to say goodbye. And this is a poem that takes place at the station. station. We're saying goodbye on the platform. In silence, the huge train waits, crowding the station with aftermath and longing and all we've never said to one another. 
He shoulders his black bag and shifts from foot to foot, restless to be off, his eyes wandering over tinted windows where he'd sit, staring out at the Hudson's platinum dazzle. I want to tell him he's entering into the light of the world, but it feels like a long tunnel as he leaves one home, one parent for another, and we both know it won't ever be the same again. What is the air at, keeping between us, then thinning to nothing? Or those slate-gray birds that croon to themselves in an iron angle, then take flight, inscribing huge loops of effortless grace between this station of shade and the shining water. When our cheeks rest glancing against each other, I can feel mine scratchy with beard and stubble, his not quite smooth as a girl's, harder, a faint fuzz starting. Those silken beginnings I can see when the light is right, his next life in bright first touches. What ails our hearts? Mine aching in vain for the words to make sense of our life together, his fluttering in dread of my finding the words, feathered syllables fidgeting in his tro throat. In a sudden rush of bodies and announcements out of the air, he says he's got to be going. One quick touch and he's gone. In a minute, the train, ghostly faces behind smoked glass, groans away on wheels and shackles, a slow glide I walk beside, waving at what I can see no longer. Later, on his own in the city, he'll enter the underground and cross the river, going home to his mother's house. I imagine that white face carried along in the dark glass, shining through shadows that fill the window and fall away again before we're even able to name them. That's very nice. It reminds me uh, that the, the subject of journeys uh, calls to mind a comment I read somewhere recently. I can't even remember by whom. I think it was Ron Paget or someone like that, who said there are two kinds of poems. One is is like the, the journey that you plan in advance. You buy tickets and you know your destination and your arrival and departure times. Right. And, and the other is the kind where you get in the car and start driving and, mm -hmm. and not knowing where you're mm -hmm. going to wind up. Mm -hmm. How do you write when you write? Well, two ways, uh, both of these ways in some ways, uh, yeah. I suppose. There is the planned poem. I think those early things in the earlier part of the work were that. A poem like the the one I had there wanders, meanders. You, you can see that on the page. Yeah. Um, I don't think you should know. A poem should teach you what you want to say. Yes. I learn by going where I want to go, you know, the right, uh, right. Villanelle. Uh, and so in some ways, I prefer to think of myself in the second mode because it seems to me that the discoveries you make along that particular journey are more provocative yes. and more... Uh, um, um, revealing, more illuminating in the end. Uh, you know, when, as, I, as I read reviewers and others talking about your work, they, they, they focus in on your, uh, your dealing with relationships and uh, the mundane realities of life and all of that. But mm. I, I couldn't help but read the work, particularly in, as if it matters, in terms of the kind of metaphorical uh, uh, infrastructure of the poems. The, the play between light and dark and yeah. light and shadow and the, yeah. the personification of the natural world throughout. Yeah. And uh, I yeah. kept getting caught up in that. Is how, how deliberate is that? Or are those mostly unconscious aesthetic decisions? Yeah, I think they should way? be unconscious. I mean, I'd say if they're there by design, the, uh, the, sense, of their, the sense of their you know, calculation will be too much. We're starting to, to, uh, to run out of time a little bit. And mm. uh, I, I think... Perhaps if you could read one more okay. poem sure. uh, to uh, sort of round things out That'd here. That'd be fine. Yeah, I'll read because it's not unlike the one you're talking about, what you've just talked about, a journey in a poem. And this is a love poem. It's a birthday poem. But it really is a poem which does something that I like to do quite often in a poem. And that is really just to celebrate what's immediately in front of me. Morning, the 22nd of March. All the green things in the house on fire with greenness. The trees in the garden take their naked ease like Demoiselle d'Avignon. We came awake to the spider plant's crisp shadow printing the pillowcase between us. Limp fingers of steam curl auspiciously from the cup of tea I've brought you. A 
and the blue jay screeches blue murder beyond the door. In a painting over the bed, five tea-coloured cows stand hock-deep in water at the broad bend of a river, small smooth-backed stones turtling its near margin. A brace of leafy branches leans over it from the far bank, where the sun spreads an open field like butter, while the cows bend down to the dumbfound smudge of their own faces in a flat metallic water. And here, this minute at the bristle tip of the scotch pine, a cardinal starts singing. Seven compound metal notes, equal in beat, then silence, then again, the identical seven. Between the size the cars and pickups make, relenting for the curve with a little gasp of gears, we hear over the road among the faintly flesh pink limbs and glow of the apple orchard, a solitary dove throating three sweet mournful ohm, then falling silent, then our life together, hesitating in this gap of silence, slipping from us and becoming nothing we know in the swirl that has no past, no future, nothing but the pure pulse shroud of light, the dread here, now, reporting thrice again its own silence. The cup of tea still steams between your hands like some warm offering or other to the nameless radiant vacancy at the window. This stillness in which we go on happening. Eamon, thank you. That was a, a terrific poem, as, as all of yours are. And thank you for being with us here. Thanks very much, Terry. I really enjoyed it. Don't know what I said, but it was wonderful. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us on The Writing Life. See you again next time. Thank you.